Thank you for joining me today. It's Thursday, and I know some of you have been working and going to the store, and life just continues for you like normal. But for many others, they have quarantined themselves at home, or they are just practicing social distancing. My desire for these devotions was to provide a resource for you to open your Bible, read it, study it, study it, and apply it. Now, your specific format for watching these may be just watching it from your office or your living room and surfing the web too, but you could use it in another way as well. You could take these devotions and use them with some songs from YouTube to provide a worship experience for you and your family. You could begin by singing some songs, listen to the devotion, and then end with a time of discussion and prayer. But however you choose to utilize them is your decision. I just wanted to provide a resource for you and for your family during this time. Now today we're going to be looking at John chapter 6. I want to talk to you about one of the signs which John gives to us. Now John records that Jesus did a lot of miracles, but he only recorded seven of those miracles. John's purpose in recording those is found in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He wrote, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He could have recorded a multitude of miracles, but John recorded these seven miracles as signs so it would point someone the reader to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So now we've worked through signs one, two, and three, and we are up to the fourth sign. Now there is one miracle that is found in all four Gospels. Of course, the resurrection is found in all four Gospels, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a miracle that Jesus performed in front of the other uh, in front of other people. It's the feeding of the 5,000. From just its occurrence, in all four Gospels, we should understand that it's a very important miracle. But even after the incredible display of power, there were some people who just did not believe in Jesus. And so what I want us to do is I want us to read this passage And I'm going to read a verse or two, and then I will explain or give some type of illustration, and we'll just make our way through the passages. So beginning in John chapter 6, and I'm going to begin by reading verses 5 and 6. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him. For he himself knew what he was intending to do. Jesus had compassion on the people because they were like a sheep without a shepherd, we are told. They were wandering aimlessly and needed someone to guide them and protect them. So Jesus asked Philip because it was Philip's neck of the woods, if we want to put it like that. Now, if I go to Corinth, if I go to New Albany or to Nettleton, And if I'm hungry, I'm going to ask some locals where to get the food. If Amanda and I visit her cousin in Memphis, then we're going to ask them where to get some food. When we go to New Orleans, I'm going to ask a native person where I should get some food. And so Jesus looked to Philip and asked Philip where they could buy some bread. But notice what the verse reads. He says, He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. This didn't catch Jesus off guard. This was happening according to God's plan. It was happening just according 
to the way Jesus and God wanted it to happen. Now let's read verse 7. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. Philip realized that the crowd was so large that it would take a lot of money to feed the people. Now in verse 10, we are told that the men numbered 5,000 men. But unless it was a men's conference or a promise keeper's gathering, there must have been some women and children there as well. And everything being considered, a conservative estimate could be around 20,000 people in attendance. I mean, if there are 5,000 men, let's just assume that there are 5,000 women and with at least two children apiece, if there are families, we're looking at somewhere between 20,000 people. Do you know how much 200 denarii are? A denarius represents one day's worth of wages. So 200 denarii is the equivalent of eight months worth of wages. That's an incredible amount of money. Just imagine working eight months to feed a group of people one meal on one day. Philip realized they didn't have enough money to feed all of those people. All right, let's look at John chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Now, before you start praising Andrew and patting him on the back and, and saying what a great man of faith he is, let's just look at the whole statement. In Mark, Jesus sends them out to search for food, and Andrew comes back and reports that they have found some food. Now, Andrew said, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. And if Andrew would have stopped there, we could praise him for his great faith. But notice what he continues to say. He says, but what are they for so many? In one sense, we can see that He has found the food. He is bringing the boy to Jesus, but yet he does not believe that Jesus can do anything with those five loaves and two fish. Philip failed the test of faith, and now Andrew has two. Two people in this narrative that have already failed. The person standing in front of Philip and Andrew was the same person who turned water into wine. He was the same person who healed the official son from a great distance away. He is the same person who healed that man who had been lame for 38 years. But Jesus knows what he is going to do, and he instructs the disciples. So we could ask ourselves, why is this little boy walking around with five barley loaves and two fish? Well, this is a little boy's lunch. He's not a chubby little boy trying to eat a lot of food with five (laughs) with five loaves and two fish. The five loaves are more like biscuits or crackers and the fish are more like sardines. It's this little boy's lunch. The fish were for him to smear on the bread so they could, so he could have a little bit of taste to go with the bread and it wouldn't choke him on the way down. So let's see what Jesus does with the bread and the fish. Verse 10, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Again, the men numbered 5,000. So with the women and children, I'm assuming this could be a crowd of about 20,000 people. Now just to put that into perspective, the city of Corinth, where I am currently, has around 14 or had around 14,000 people in 2017. So the people Jesus fed on that day represents 1.4% of Corinth's population. Look at verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish as much as they wanted. Jesus took the loaves and fish, gave thanks, and distributed them to the people. Now, I'm truly blessed, and my family, I believe, is blessed. 
My family, we eat three meals together around our table. I get up and we eat breakfast. I come home from the office and we eat lunch together. And later that day, Amanda cooks again and we eat together again. Now, let me just describe to you what usually happens when we're sitting around the dinner table about to eat. Usually it's something like this. I will say, hey, let's bow our heads to pray. And either I will pray or I'll call on one of the kids to pray. But usually we begin to bow and pray. And instead of everyone bowing their head in prayer, my kids are usually like this. They got their eyes open and they're looking to see if we're bowing our head, to see if Amanda's bowing her head, if I'm bowing my head, to see which other kid is looking at them. And usually it goes something like this. I will kind of crack my eye open and I will look. And when I see one of them looking around, I'll look at them and I'll go. And that is the universal sign for all parents that in a prayer that says, hey, you bow your head right now. And so, of course, that's what they do. They begin bowing their head. Titus is over there. That's my youngest son. He is usually there, and he's just, uh, he's just eating his food already <laughs> in the prayer. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them record that Jesus took the food, looked up into heaven, and gave thanks. Now, in our day and time, we bow our heads and we bless our food. Jesus looked up into heaven and gave thanks. Now, I'm not telling you that you should change the way you pray over your meals, but I am telling you that you need to remember who to thank for that food. Jesus didn't bow. He did not close his eyes. He just looked up into heaven and thanked God for sending that food. And he broke it and he broke it and he broke it. So whether you look up or you bow your head down, make sure that your prayer is directed toward God. Make sure your prayer thanks God for His graciousness to you and the others who are with you. Now I want you to look again at verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, He distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. Philip had said that 200 denarii, eight months worth of wages, wasn't enough to give them a little bit of food. But with Jesus, he was able to provide all that they wanted. And it says that they had their fill of fish. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? With Jesus, he doesn't halfway do anything. When he turned the water into the wine, it was the best wine they had ever drank. When Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and the people were filled to the brim with fish and bread, I mean, he, was, he is able to do to the uttermost to those who come to him. And I would even say this, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to Him in faith. Now, I hope you'll remember that. Jesus doesn't do anything halfway. He does it completely. Look at verses 12 through 13. When they were filled, He said to His disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by the house, by those who had eaten. After the people had their field, Jesus told them to collect all of the leftovers so nothing is wasted. And I would say, well, there you go, men. There's, there's the evidence that collecting leftovers at least has a biblical precedence. But in all seriousness, just because Jesus, just because God blessed these people did not give them the right to waste what he had given to them. God provides, but we do not waste the provisions that he gives. We are called to be good stewards of everything he has given to our care. That is the earth, that is the sanctuary, that is the, the money and the resources that he gives to this church, to me and also to you and your families. 
they collected and they filled at least 12 basketfuls of pieces. Now look at verse 14. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. The people believed the sign. They believed the, what in the miracle that Jesus had done. They actually quote or reference some verses from Deuteronomy where God tells the Israelites that another prophet like Moses would come into the world. Moses was a man who was coronated by God with signs and wonders. And all of what God did to release the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. The giving of manna each day he provided to them bread. The people on that side of the Sea of Galilee that day made a connection between Jesus providing that bread and the scripture of a prophet coming like Moses. So what does this passage teach us? First, Jesus is concerned with people. He saw the people. He realized they needed food. And I would say this, Jesus is concerned with what we're going through right now. And whatever you may be going through, whether it's a loss of a family member, Jesus cares for you and he is concerned for you. It could be sickness and all of the sickness that is happening in our world and our nation right now. Listen, Jesus is concerned about us and he is concerned about you. It could be financial. You may have just lost your job. You could be worried about not getting to work this week. Jesus knows, and I can tell you, he, is ca he cares about you and he is concerned for you. Now, second, Jesus used people to accomplish his miracles. Now, Jesus had supernaturally divided the five loaves and two fish for the people. Just as easily, Jesus could have supernaturally delivered that fish to the people as well. But if you look at the passage, now, the book of John, which we read, says that he distributed the food. But the other books tell us that Jesus gave the food to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the people. Even when the feast was over, it says that the disciples came and they picked up all of the pieces and brought them back to Jesus. Do you see the significance in the passage? See, everyone wants God to do a miracle. We want God to work in miraculous ways, but a lot of people do not want to help God accomplish the miracle. Now, I'm not saying that God needs our help. He does not need our help. Jesus, though, did use the disciples to distribute the food. Listen, I, I think it would be honest inappropriate for me to say that we at Holly Baptist Church, we want to see a revival. We want to see the baptistry full. I want to see people coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but we have a part to play in that. And just even with what is happening in our world right now, there are people who need us to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. That neighbor who is praying for a miracle may be waiting for you as well to come and be the hands of feet for Christ and to provide a means or a conduit for God's blessings to flow through you to that person. Third, Jesus has, has enough left over for you. No matter how many people got fed, there was still some food left over. Now listen, no matter how many people have been satisfied on God's grace, there is still enough grace for you. No matter how many people have been saved, you can be saved too. Jesus has enough left over for you and he has enough left over for me. And he's willing to give it to you. What are you willing to give to him? See, the problem in the passage was man's hunger and man's desire. The answer to man's problem with hunger and desire is Jesus. Jesus is enough for you.